Hello, everyone. Um, as I was saying earlier, my name is Shoko. I'm the housekeeper uh, for this dialogue today. Um, and uh, if you would like to have the, the gallery view enabled, please go to the top right, click on the view, and then select gallery so that you can see everybody um, when, I'm, when I'm not being on the spotlight here. Um, and uh, little, uh, yeah, so that's that. And so I just, on, on this note, I just wanted to, to start off by saying welcome everybody. Um, uh, thank you so much for joining today's um, uh, Power Gai dialogue session number eight, expanding diasporic imaginaries. Uh, once again, my name is Shoko Kitano, and the and I'm actually one of the board members at Powell, uh, Powell Street Festival Society. I've been with the board about um, four years, and um, I'm speaking to you today from the traditional and unceded land of the Squamish Nation, uh, Slely Walto Nation, and Musqueam Nation. I'm originally from Tokyo, Japan, and um, I came to this land called Canada back in 2001. I identify myself as a woman of color and an immigrant, a new settler, and uh, a person with disability. I'm legally blind and um, can't really see any of your faces when you're on the gallery view, which kind of plays in my favor because I don't have to get nervous about it too much. So here we go. There's always a positive side to everything. Um, I just also wanted to say that I, I benefit tremendously from this land and all uh, that it, it, it offers. It is a gift, gift that I receive every single day and I'm truly grateful for that. And I strive towards um, continuous learning of the history of this land. Um, and, uh, and also I strive towards giving back by offering the gift of diversity and a unique perspective to the society and the people that we share the land with. So today's topic is intriguing to me um, in many different ways expanding diasporic imaginaries. I'm very much looking forward to our guest um, host as well as the panelists today. What does that mean to you when, I, when you hear expanding diasporic imaginaries? I'm just gonna speak a little bit from my perspective. So um, let's just say I have a very complex relationship with the society <laughs> um, here as well as back in Japan. Um, when I was living there as well. I just always felt somewhat an outsider, you can say, um, er, er, wherever I go. I, I just feel like I'm the embodiment of the intersectionality in many ways. And I just don't really belong anywhere, but on, by the same token, I also do belong everywhere. It's a weird feeling, I know. Um, so the first impression of the Powell Street Festival when I came um, to Canada and also I attended the festival for the first time with my friends at that time, um, I was just really struck by the spirit of, and the atmosphere of that festival. Um, it just you know, captured the past and also the current and the progressiveness uh, of the culture um, at the same time. It, it, it just, I guess, reminded me of the, um, the image of Japan that I keep in my mind and I keep longing to and seeking. I say image because it's not real. I, I know um, because whenever I visit my families and friends back in Japan, whatever that I had the image or the memory, it, it, it's, it's, you know, it's gone through a lot of filters. It's like an, on an Instagram, like when you put a lot of filters, it just looks so beautiful and looks so appealing. But I also know whenever I do go back, it, it's not true it, and it's, it's not real. Um, uh, and it doesn't, some pieces exist, but it's not really um, holistically doesn't exist anymore. So um, it, it's interesting because my memory, the image is so vivid in my mind and so real but yet it's not at the same time. So it's a very strange feeling um, as well. So uh, just quickly, uh, when I go back, I, I, people say, okaeri, that means welcome back. And then I say, tadaima, that means 
I'm good to be back or good to be back, some, something, something to that effect. And that exchange always makes me feel like it's so odd. It's a strange feeling because what am I really coming back to? Um, yeah, so anyhow, um, when I you know, go to the Powell, Fe Powell Street Festival, um, I have this comforting feeling, but also this sense of sadness that comes at the same time. Um, it's a weird uh, kind of feeling that I get. But um, so th I appreciate, Amy, thank you for approaching me to be the, the housekeeper today, um, this opportunity to reflect and share this uh, experience and feelings that I have uh, with everybody here today. So once again, thank you. So uh, just changing the, the tone a bit. So I just wanted to acknowledge uh, our supporters, financial supporters today. This series um, uh, is made possible thanks to HAPA Collaborative, SFU, uh, David Lamb Center, Canada Council for the Arts, BC Arts Council, City of Vancouver, and um, uh, also individual donor, donors, as well as in kind supporters, um, such as the Bull Bulletin Magazine and Element IQ. Um, some housekeeping items to share here. Uh, so we are, as I said, recording the presentations and the recordings will be available on our Powell Street Festival Society YouTube channel. If you're not following us on the channel, please do. And then turn, um, turn, your, turn off your camera if you wish to stay private. And uh, also closed captioning is available. So if you wish to turn that all on, um, you can do so at the bottom of the, uh, the screen as well. Um, the Q&A session will be um, right after the panelists' presentations, so please feel free to add your uh, questions in the chat box in the meantime, and also when you're speaking up um, during the, uh, the session, uh, if you could say your name, let's say it's Shoko speaking, that would be great, um, so that, uh, for example, I would know uh, it, who, who it is that you're speaking. I don't know your voice yet, so that would be really helpful for me as well. Um, and uh, and also the priority today is to hear everybody's um, uh, perspective during the breakout groups. So, um, uh, but but at the same time, we do have the contextual and te technological constraints. So I ask the facilitators to be mindful of the time make and please to make sure everybody has the chance to share. And also for the participants, please uh, participate actively, listen to others uh, in the group and also value everyone's uh, perspective as well. Um, and, oh yes, and also if you wish to continue the dialogue, um, please do so on the Powell Street Festival Society's Facebook page, on the discussion page there. We uh, also not following uh, us on Facebook, please do. And then um, we can, you can uh, find, find that link to that on the Powell Rugai dialogue event page. Okay, so um, without any further ado, I would like to introduce our guests speaker today, um, Ayumi Koto. Uh, so she is a performance artist and a scholar, and Ayumi often draws upon um, her Japanese heritage as well as language, and then um, uh, she creatively challenges nation building, cultural belonging, and um, activism. So Ayumi has uh, performed all over the world. I'm not gonna even mention all the names of the cities because there's so many. And um, she is currently experimenting with becoming a diasporic scholar. Okay, Ayumi, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Shoko. I think some of the considerations that you brought up um, about your own experiences of living in Canada and going going to see family um, in Japan, um, that feeling of not belonging or being an outsider is going to resonate quite a bit today with um, uh, the participants that who are all here in the room. Um, I want to start off by um, stating that um, in the Dish with One Spoon uh, Treaty territory, um, which I believe covers Hamilton as well. And just less than a week ago, I was in Likwangwen territory visiting with my mother. And so it's very uh, interesting to um, be in Ontario because I've only been here for about uh, three years. And I was really surprised to find out that there are over 40 treaties that have been signed in Ontario. So living in BC, um, primarily unceded territory, unceded lands, um, 
I, I think I can feel a difference, but I'm not quite, I can't quite put it into words. Um, so thank you very much. I want to thank um, the Powell Street Festival for welcoming us as a group. Uh, so uh, uh, Andrea Fatona, Peter Morin, Abadar Kamgari and myself uh, to be part, of, to be in, to be the number eight dialogue uh, for the Powell Street uh, series. Um, by way of introducing uh, the panelists, um, I don't want to read their bios. Uh, I, I actually want to say that when I was first invited by Emmy um, Emiko to to uh, guest uh, host this dialogue, I was thinking, who do I want in the room to be in conversation with, and who do I want to see in conversation? And I thought, well, uh, Andrea Fatona, Peter Moore, and uh, uh, Abadar Kamgari, and and then I thought afterward, well what do they actually have in common? And um, I think what attracts me to them is, I'm a little bit embarrassed that the bio that was read of me says that I'm a, I'm a scholar <laughs> and a performance artist. I'm um, actually, I still consider myself definitely um, a performance apprentice and, um, and a scholar in training as well as a scholar apprentice. And I see uh, Andrea Fatona, Peter Moore and, and Abidora Kamgari as uh, people that I really look up to and admire and uh, learn from artistically, culturally, uh, politically, and um, just through different knowledges. So what I see that um, all three have in common is that they all have a deep, deep heart and having deep considerations um, and careful thought around the work that they do politically, creatively, culturally. And um, th threaded through all of that is this idea of deep, perseverance. Um, there are, of course, distinctions, um, as well as uh, distinctive similarities. So they each come from complex uh, cultural histories. So Andrea's mother is Jamaican and her father is Nigerian. Peter's mother is Palten and his father is um, French Canadian. And Abidar's uh, mother is Persian and her father is Kurdish. And so they're coming from very different within the families, the family themselves. There's a lot of different mixing of colonizations, different histories, uh, different intergenerational inheritances, including traumas, artistic practice, and um, indomitable spirit. Um, I also see that they reach across multiple communities while at the same time questioning what that question of belonging, do they belong or not? Um, and how do they belong? And when they belong, how do they invite others in? And I love the generosity of all three of them. And I continue to be inspired by them when I listen to them talk and I see their uh, cur curatorial work, artwork, and just social engagement with the world around them. Um, and the, I mean, the, the title, Expanding Diasporic Imaginaries, it sounds so scholarly and academic and the word diaspora I think brings to mind this idea often of a more international like moving from one country to like the home country in one direction to this new country. But as I've mentioned with um, Andrea, Peter and Abadar, they're coming from multiple histories, multiple moments of passing by each other and passing uh, within different realms of uh, cultural and political existence. And when I think of diaspora, I've been really, um, I had this really big memory, recent memory of um, the first time I saw fireworks. And it was the first time my family went to uh, um, Japan as a family. And I was a very sickly child, so I wasn't allowed to get excited or else I would get very, very sick. But anyway, um, it was a, um, um, a summer festival and uh, there were these, astounding fireworks. I was five years old and I just remember seeing different shapes in the sky like um, uh, flowers and sort of faces and just different formations and I was just so impressed by it that I thought oh maybe I made it up maybe the fireworks weren't in flower shapes but they were and because I asked my mom and then just before I came back mom and I were watching a documentary on how fireworks are made and the 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 intergenerational knowledge that's passed um, and the, the craftsmanship to make the container for the fireworks, fireworks themselves is so beautifully crafted. And then it goes up into the sky and then prismatically scatters in multiple colors in multiple directions. And I was thinking diaspora is sort of like fireworks because um, um, uh, the, 
there's something that seems like it's the starting point, you can never recompile it into the singular thing and the lights and the sounds and the smell go in multiple directions. And for this talk, I was going to uh, look for an example of firework, but I have this image, this memory in my head of what it should look like. So every, every firework video just was insufficient. And um, um, what I do remember though, is that there is a collective experience of the scent of the smoke, the vibration from the sound, the, um, it, the collective excitement and the awe of looking up and just seeing something so beautiful, and then it disappears. And so there is that sadness there. Um, there is that explosion of possibility there. Um, and then there isn't that thing to go back home to. Um, with that, I wish to introduce uh, Andrea and Peter and Abadar. So uh, Andrea will be speaking first, um, then followed by Peter, then Abadar. And then after that, we'll open up to conversations. I really want this to be as dialogical as possible. And I just welcome all of the participants today to um, join in with questions, uh, comments, or answers if, um, if, if, we are, if, I, if we I might pose everybody a question for um, open discussion. So uh, Andrea Fotena, welcome to this panel. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you, uh, Powell Street Festival, for organizing this series, and thanks to Ayumi for inviting me. And also thanks to my fellow panelists, Peter and Abadar, for being here to um, converse. So at first I wasn't quite sure what I would talk about, and um, I'm a little bit sure. Um, I also want to say that I am here in, in Toronto. Um, and I would like to also acknowledge the fact that there have been Indigenous folks here for thousands of years prior. There continue to be Indigenous folks here. And um, want to say that I am an ally in the continued um, discussion and work to actually liberate spaces for all of us. I, as um, Ayumi pointed out, I come from a long line of Yoruba folks from Nigeria on my father's side and uh, Jamaicans on my mother's side. And I consider myself a stolen person on stolen lands and continue to create my alliances out of that positionality as well. So I wanted to talk a little bit about Hogan's Alley in the context of work I've done. And after just having a quick chat with the uni about perhaps what I could talk about and to talk about um, collaboration as a way to think about the work I do and also to further my understanding of what it means to be black in Canada and black in different spaces in Canada. So I moved to uh, Vancouver in um, the late 80s and 89. And I'd uh, worked, done a lot of work in Toronto and you know, worked at the Ontario Black History Society. I think when I was 17, doing some cataloging there and coming to understand Black settlement histories in Ontario. Spending a lot of time learning about Buxton and, and really coming to terms with understanding the relationships around settlement and different moments of settlement for Black folks here. Having moved to Vancouver, um, you know, knew, knew a little bit about settlement from in terms of a Salt Spring Island story, but not much about the place that I, I was in in Vancouver. So my interest came out of just wanting to understand the place. I'd landed in in Vancouver. And also the fact that there weren't very many black folks to be seen on the streets compared to say Toronto. So it felt somewhat isolated. So Hogan's Alley became a way into trying to understand where, where I was and also allowed me, you know, now that it's, I guess it's almost, I don't know, over 20 years since the piece was made, um, allow me to grow up and have be able to reflect on it in ways. And what I realized, you know, in the context of this, this um, panel or discussion is that what I was trying to do, I was trying to understand 
um, what it meant to be Black in the space of Vancouver. Was it different from being Black in Toronto? Is it different from being Black in the Caribbean or, or in Lagos, Nigeria? And, and my way into that was through um, an intergenerational, interracial collaboration. And collaboration was something I was really in, and continue to be uh, really interested in. Collaboration as a way to um, pragmatically uh, share resources. Uh, collaboration as a way to, I guess I came to an understanding of myself or realized that I'm not very good at some things. There's some things I'm good at, there are other things I'm not, and there are people who are really, really good at it. So came to the realization early that, you know, it is a good thing to work with other people to bring the parts together to create something that's much bigger than any whole that I could ever imagine. So I've taken up collaboration as a strategy for working, a strategy for learning, for my, my uh, ability to learn, and a strategy to push me outside of my own comfort zone. Um, and I think it's been working well. It's really, really difficult to do, but it tends to pay off in spades. So the, the kind of collaboration that took place to make Hogan Zali, and Hogan Zali is a 30 minute documentary uh, co-produced and directed by myself and Cornelia Weingarten, who's a Vancouver-based artist, white lesbian. Um, we collaborated on it. We did the research over two, three years in terms of archival research. Um, I had to reach across what I realized over time that this was a deep intergenerational piece of work in that we worked with three women who lived or had experiences of Hogan's Alley, Hogan's Alley being a site in Vancouver that was the home of um, uh, Black folks between the 30s and the 60s. It ran between Union and Pryor and I think Maine and Jackson. And so, you know, part of what I was doing was trying to also find home for now. And I think wherever I go, I try to find home for now. Um, home doesn't necessarily mean something that is there in a kind of um, fixed way, but it's made wherever I go. And part of making that home is also finding out who um, came before me into that space, um, both in terms of indigenous folks and folks who continue to come. So back to the story of making the piece, um, worked with three women, uh, Thelma, Pearl and Leah, who had um, long relationships with the, the space called Hogan's Alley. The Hogan's Alley was um, uh, raised at a certain point in the 70s to make space for the Georgia Viaduct. And I think, again, it's being raised to make space for something else. So in order to create the kinds of uh, dialogues that needed to take place between the women who, who were part of this 30 minute video, who are part of this 30 minute video, it meant that I needed to get to know them and they needed to get to know me. And I realized that this is like a really deep component to any of the collaborative work and partnerships I do that it requires time and time to know each other, time to um, understand who we are and what we want from a process um, and to work that out. And sometimes they don't work out as we, we need them to work out. In that initially we, we, Corey and I wanted to have four women involved and one woman would not uh, participate. And it took time to realize that, you know, um, although we're trying to tell stories that have never been told that the stories are not only ours, they belong to a collective as well. And hence um, the input of the collectives really needed. The other thing that became really clear to me in terms of uh, working on the piece was also, you know, Yumi was talking about diaspora and this notion of the fireworks. I think the thing that came for me and continues to inform my work is that in terms of diaspora, particularly Black diaspora, that it's something that has to be made and remade. Um, it just doesn't exist as, as in a static form. 
So in terms of the diasporic connections that took place in terms of the making of the piece called Hogan's Alley, I spent a lot of time making sweet potato pudding with Pearl, one of the participants in, in the piece. And um, I guess I should circle back to say many of the folks who settled in Vancouver came up through the under, through um, the prairies. They came from Kentucky, came to the prairies, and then came to Vancouver. A number of folks also um, were traveling across co the country because men, the only um, employment men would, could find was as sleeping car uh, porters on the CN Railroad. And so Hogan's Alley was the terminus of the CN Rail, it was right around um, the Via Rail area. So I guess what I'm trying to say, what I realized as well through that project, and it continues through other projects, that I'm reaching across communities or I'm reaching across or across into my own community, saying to the Black community, which I had no context with in Vancouver, that part of making this happen is, is an activity that one has to be involved in, whether or not it's through storytelling, it's whether or not it's through a connection, through sharing food, um, whether or not, and for me, it was that idea of cooking and hearing stories. Um, I'm not quite sure what else I have to say, but I think the biggest thing about the Hogan's Alley project and having to think about it for this discussion was to think about the fact that, you know, what it did for me was really um, allowed me to understand how to work intergenerationally within this, within this um, space called the Black community, to really think about the Black community as not homogeneous, um, as, as um, multicultured, um, coming um, with different histories of settlement to this country. And the project allowed me to, um, to be able to talk across these different spaces of Black diaspora within the space of Vancouver. So I'll leave it there and have other questions come up in the Q&A. Hi, hi everybody. Um, uh, first, I want to um, I want to say "Zana hotia azekta ushe di dana jasini ensini klago hin tatla kluachan nande edu di dana ke hodese." Uh, my name in our language, Taltan Nation language, is Azekta. Uh, I also have a name, uh, Peter Morin, which our mom uh, gave to me. The name uh, Peter is a name I share with my father, who is French Canadian, and he is, uh, his name is Pierre. Our mom is a Crow clan woman from the Tal Tan Nation. And I just said, um, I just said, uh, um, I don't speak our language very well. So don't ask me. <laughs> and um, I think I, I want to um, start there. Uh, and I want to start. I want to continue with just with acknowledging Powell Street and the organizers of Powell Street and the, the profound offerings that Powell Street uh, uh, gives to us. And um, I lived in Vancouver for quite a few years and have been to Powell Street quite a number of times and have always found myself to be um, overwhelmed by the generosity and the strength of the community. Um, I want to also acknowledge, uh, continue and acknowledge uh, uh, my best friend, Ayumi Goto, um, who I love and adore, and uh, always challenging me to uh, think more and think bigger than myself. And uh, this conversation um, does that for me. I feel um, overwhelmed and vulnerable. Uh, in all of the best ways. Um, I want to acknowledge Andrea Fatona and Abadar, two uh, close friends who are um, close into 
to my world who I also look towards for guidance and, and um, to help me. I look towards them to help me with my dreaming. I want to acknowledge uh, my uh, brother and best friend, Ashok Mathur, uh, who also inspires me. Uh, I don't know why I'm so emotional. <laughs> um, I think this conversation is very important to me. Uh, I also want to acknowledge uh, one of my elders and teachers, Harupa Okano. Uh, you have a beautiful face <laughs> and a beautiful heart, a beautiful spirit. And I am, um, I think that these kind of conversations are so important. It's so important in how we can see each other and actually be with each other and stand with each other, align ourselves with each other. And, you know, the thing that I was thinking about, and I, I mean, I had a quick visit with Ayumi yesterday too, because I, I was nervous and I, I do feel emotional, you know, because um, I want to do a good job. I'm going to do a good job. And that part is, you know, also coming from the place that I was raised and the culture that I'm raised up in, Taltan Nation culture. And I want to do a good job in that regard, from that, sorry, from that place, because Powell Street, I've always witnessed and experienced Powell Street doing such an incredible job for so many people, you know? And um, so there's that kind of... Uh, in, uh, important um, ac action. And um, I, I wanted to uh, talk about relationships as my, as my offering. And I wanted to, <laughs> I wanted to talk about how, how um, and Ayumi helped me with this yesterday because I, I what, as I mentioned, I was feeling a bit nervous. And uh, the thing about how do we, how do we make relationships across ancestries, you know? Um, and it, it would be hard for me not to talk about my work with Ayumi, you know, the shared work. And I mean, we use the word collaboration often, but we also, it, I think it, you know, collaboration does a different thing as well because it goes deeper and it gets bigger, right? And, and so at some point it becomes about shared living and shared lives, right? Um, but at the same time with, within, that, uh, within that shared living and shared lives, uh, I still need to be able to speak from the place of training that I have inherited from our mother and our mother's good work on, our, on behalf of myself and my siblings. My mother, her, her name is Adzutza. Her English name is, um, the English name she goes by is Janelle. And uh, the, the cultural matrix that she shared with me uh, growing up uh, prioritized relationships, prioritized building those relationships. And, and you know, the thing that becomes important here um, for me, and maybe for us uh, in this room is uh, about how um, colonization and the, and the efforts of Canada to separate us from each other uh, become so real and so tangible. Like they, they become like a solid shape that is wedged between people. You know, and I, I think part of my work uh, reaching across, uh, reaching across and opening up uh, cross cultural, uh, cross ancestral, I like to think of it as that. And Ayumi and I, we, we share that word cross ancestral um, collaboration. So not just our physical bodies in the present moment in, the, in these contexts of this moment, but also the acknowledgement that our physical bodies include multiple bodies and multiple generations, right? And that, that kind of wedge again, uh, that, that um, government, I mean, it is a genocidal thing that, that they, Canada perpetrated against indigenous people 
as only one. Many people, many people of color were attacked viciously by Canada, you know, and the agents of Canada, right? Um, so the, the, the piece about being able to speak to and practice and prioritize cross ancestral collaboration, you know, it, it's not just an, uh, for me, it's not just an intention, it's actually a way to be alive and uh, to be more present to the power that my body is having, you know, and being, right? And Canada did this thing to Indigenous people, as we know, in the residential school, where they, they created a kind of a narrative around the strength of Indigenous people, uh, um, which uh, often settles upon the word survivor, right? Um, but underneath that word survivor is so much uh, incredible strength. And those children who were stolen and, uh, uh, from their families, were trained how to be strong, right? And um, so the, the, it's a, it is actually a, a, a daily practice. And I, I do make a lot of mistakes, right? Um, and at the same time, um, there are these expansive moments, which I hold on to, which help me to to actually prioritize cross ancestral collaboration and the reaching across the table to share food with the with people of the world. Uh, Taltan Nation uh, um, historically are people who walked on the land for months at a time. And uh, one of the things about that action is when you meet someone on the land, you want to be kind to them because they have information of the world which may help you to survive. So there's that piece too, and the practice of that, you know? So in Ayumi and I's collaborations, um, or Ashok and I's collaborations, or the collaborations I get to have with folks, um, I, uh, I, tr I try and remember that. If I'm not open to the story of people, then I'm not um, being open to the possibilities of um, my survival and their survival. Yeah, and that's my priority. Yeah, um, I, there's so much I wanted to share, but I, I instead I just got emotional and took up space with my emotions. Uh, but what I, I I'd like to just you know I just would like to. Um, there's more to, to talk about with us as a group, um, but what I wanted to do was to take a moment to share something from my, my community um, and, uh, and how the culture that we come from, Taltan Nation people, right? Uh, and I'm, I'm speaking from my own experience and my own understanding of the cultural matrix, right? And, um, and the intervention of Canada to, to uh, interrupt the flow of that cultural matrix and how that matrix, that practice, that space building, that relationship building uh, creates power inside of your bo my body. And it also creates power in the, uh, in the inside of the body of the people I'm meeting, right? Um, and so in our community, uh, the North, Northern BC, so if you were in Vancouver, you would drive 17 hours north towards Yukon. Um, and uh, at one point, uh, it was a stopping off place. Our, our, our home territory was a stopping, stopping off place in the Yukon gold rush. And um, I grew up uh, with many stories of uh, Chinese folks living in our community and being a part of our community. And some of our community members uh, are married to and have uh, Asian ancestry, right? And my, I, I also fight really hard in this because I wanna make sure that our, my auntie Marianne, who is my grandpa's sister, who lived with Jackie Clam, right? That her story never gets ignored or forgotten, 
right? And so I just want to end with a song. I'm going to play the audio. And um, what I'm going to do is, uh, the song is uh, from our grandma, Eva. Uh, and it's a song about relationship with Chinese community uh, and spoken from and made from Taltan ways of being and reaching across. Okay. Um, okay. I think I got it. Okay. Okay. Um, please let me know if you can hear the song. I'm just going to say no talk this time. His wife go to baker, the Chinese baker. She said, I'm going to get bread. Okay, you wait till I come back for breakfast. Never come back. Never come back. You know, man, wait, wait, drink tea. And he said, what's the matter with that? My young girl always go to that old Chinaman. Never come back. Must be something wrong. Something wrong with that chicken. Because they never come back, no bread. And he make that song. That's the one. And so just to end, uh, just to end, I, I, this song uh, is composed in probably 18, uh, 1850s. Yeah, and so this is another one of those places that I hold on to because the culture is seeing the world, right? Um, thank you. Uh, it's Abadar speaking. <laughs> um, thank you, Peter and Andrea. That's, it's going to be a tough one, a tough one to follow. Um, I'm just gonna start by describing myself. I'm a light-skinned brown person. I have a short, shoulder-length uh, curly black hair. I have dark, thick eyebrows. I'm wearing round glasses and a striped navy and white shirt. Uh, the background behind me is blurred. I wanna thank Ayumi for inviting me and the Powell Street Festival staff and volunteers for all of your labor organizing this event. Um, it's, it's a big honor to be in conversation with my teachers. Um, and I'm, I'm very lucky uh, that I get to learn from them. Um, I was born and raised in Iran, uh, and I spent a couple years in Turkey as a refugee um, before I immigrated to Toronto in 2006 with my mom. I now live in Hamilton, which is the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. It's covered by the Between the Lakes Purchase of 1792. Um, it's also uh, 25 kilometers from Six Nations of the Grand River First Nation um, on the Haldimand Tract. Uh, and I, I wanna, I, I'm thinking through um, the ways in which my, my um, presence as an immigrant uh, contributes to the work of the colonial process of settling these lands. And I'm, I'm beginning to build connections in my community to, to better support indigenous sovereignty. 
uh, before coming to Canada, I had all of these dreams and fantasies about wife, what, what life would be like here. Uh, and there was this shiny image of the West uh, that people back home talked about as if this place was a utopia. And when I arrived, those dreams shattered in a lot of ways because I gradually realized that the reality is a lot more complicated. For the first several years, I felt mostly alienated and out of place. Um, I was an awkward teenager and my mom was having trouble getting her degrees and work experience recognized. The unspoken expectation was that new Im immigrants uh, assimilate quickly, that they accept any job they can find and they blend into a really fast paced life without any complaint. Um, and even though most people in our neighborhood were also recent immigrants, no one really spoke about racism or about shame or disappointment or fear, even though we all felt them. We didn't share our uh, shared experiences of isolation or displacement. We didn't talk about economic challenges that many of us faced. And in fact, we hardly acknowledged each other's presence outside of our own ethnic groups. So I've never visited Vancouver um, and my understanding of the context there is quite limited. So instead, I wanted to share some, resor uh, some encounters um, that made me feel hopeful about what could, what could be <laughs> despite all of these challenges and barriers. Um, and so these stories that I'm about to share have to do with really seeing each other and finding ways to care. So here's the first story. It was after school. I was on the Shepherd East bus between Victoria Park Avenue and Don Mills Road in Toronto uh, at that precise time of day when it's packed with all the gray clad office workers. I had had an exceptionally terrible day. I had had some negative social interaction at school that had left me feeling sad and inadequate. I was exhausted. The straps for my heavy backpack were digging into my shoulders. I was thirsty. I had a headache and the the adults on the bus just kept pressing into me and pushing against me. And the only pole that I could reach was that horizontal one that's way up, up in the ceiling of the bus. I could barely reach it. So I kept getting aggressively bumped whenever someone got off the bus. And obviously, I was, I was already in a crappy mood and everything is, is worse when you're in a foul mood. Uh, and I could barely bear being on that bus for one more minute. I remember closing my eyes and trying to breathe and wanting nothing more than to go home and crawl into bed. Just as a bus jerked into movement again after a stop, I felt this gentle tug on my sleeve, and I opened my eyes and looked down to see an elderly Asian woman sitting in front of me. She caught my eye, and without speaking a word, she pointed to an empty seat behind me, nodding like she understood. It was one of those coveted solo seats on the TTC. The TTC is the buses in Toronto for folks out in, out in BC. Um, there were a lot of older people uh, still standing that she could have signaled to, and yet she seemed to have noticed just how badly I could use a seat in that moment. I thanked her, and in doing so, I realized that she did not speak any English. And it's a rare occurrence to be truly seen and cared for uh, by a stranger in public space in Toronto, uh, even more so when there's a language barrier. And yet her gentle, kind gesture brought me out of my own world and back into the present. And now even more than 10 years uh, has, has passed since this encounter, I often return to it as a transformational uh, moment in my life that informs uh, my perspective on community and belonging. So for the next story, um, I'm just gonna give some content warnings. Um, there, were, there will be brief mention of uh, homophobic and transphobic violence. And I'm also going to mention the Sudan revolution. It's June 2019, um, and uh, a group of white supremacist protesters have disrupted the Hamilton Pride Parade and harassed and attacked festival goers. The police and government officials were very slow to address the violence that broke out against queer and trans communities, to say the least. Um, and many people were enraged about what had happened at Pride and the city's lack of care in the aftermath. So a few, a few weeks later, a group of activists uh, organize a solidarity march to bring the community together and demand that the charges against pride defenders be dropped. Hundreds of people from all walks of life showed up to this march in support. And a large group began making its way down a long route through downtown Hamilton. I was near the back of the march 
near the drum band dressed in tie dye who played a persistent cacophony of beats and bagpipes that were slightly out of sync, uh, but nonetheless made the crowd feel a lot larger than it was. The march was boisterous, it was lively. Folks in the front and the middle of the march let various chants. Some of these chants were popular enough to echo through the entire parade, while others seemed to only resound in small pockets and fizzed out kind of quickly. The march moved slowly and the organizers had set a long route. So by the time you were about halfway through, the sun was already dipping in the horizon. When, loud and, when the loud and chanty group neared the turn off of Bay Street, the organizers spread word for everyone to quiet down. We were about to turn onto Main Street, close to the City Hall forecourt. At the same time as our Solidarity March, the Sudanese diasporic community had organized a candlelit vigil in front of City Hall to honor the lives lost in the Khartoum massacre and throughout the Sudanese re revolution that spring. So at this point, the sky was deep blue, orange and purple behind us. And we rounded the corner onto Main Street, which is a wide five lane um, street. And this large crowd slowed down and grew silent. And as we walked by, the Sudanese people holding candles on this, uh, came onto the sidewalk and this large colorful crowd walked on the street and we just looked at each other. There's a moment that's really hard to describe. It's quiet. And some people in the march raised their hands uh, or their fists in solidarity. Some folks simply put their hands over their hearts. And I felt myself holding my breath and getting goosebumps. There was a sense of grief. There's also this sense of possibility. And it felt like in that moment, we were important to each other. Here's the end of the second story. Um, it's one that lives with me still, and I'm thinking about that moment often. Um, but this is this is all I will say, and I'm I'm looking forward to continuing the conversation with um, Peter and Andrea and Ayumi, and also in the breakout groups with everyone else later. Thank you for listening. Thank you, everyone. I'm actually quite emotional right now. Um, I think, uh, I mean, I, I of course have a lot of questions, but I just want to thank you all first for your openness and uh, vulnerability and heart. And this is like, like I said, this is why I wanted to have you present uh, because there's so much heart uh, and um, commitment to, to care and to be cared for. And I think that, uh, the, that reciprocity uh, that you uh, show uh, others uh, is inspiring. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to ask you, uh, I, I, I'm mindful of the time, but I wanted to ask you a couple of questions and see if you have questions for each other as well. Um, but I wanted to ask you about collaboration across uh, communities and collaborations across time. Because I think about diaspora, not just in terms of one generation, but Andrea, you're mentioning in the intergenerational collaboration. And also, you know, if I'm thinking, I don't know how long I'm going to last with the, the firework thing, but it really spreads apart. So sometimes parts of you move so far away from what you thought was th this kind of self. And so how, what are the ways that you uh, reach to find yourself again, um, especially when you're moving between different collaborative communities? Um, maybe I can go first. Uh, I don't know if I do uh, find myself. I think I have learned a lot of the time to um, be comfortable in that weird space. Um, to me, it, it is kind of like uh, the, the way that I envision it is 
I'm flying from Canada to Iran and I'm in the plane and you're kind of like, there's nothing but this plane. And that there's, you don't know the time. <laughs> you don't know what the weather is. Like there's no, no anchoring point. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, you know, not to say that I'm always in that space, but I think I, when I do find myself in that space, I don't necessarily try to come back to myself. Mm-hmm. Um, I can, it's Andrea, I can answer a little bit. And I think, you know, the question really, I, I was just with my Yoruba family in um, London and I don't speak Yoruba. I don't understand a word of it, except for certain guttural sounds that I really know what they mean. So I think in my collaborations, I'm really actually trying to not necessarily find myself in the original sense that I came into the collaboration. I'm always hoping for a remaking that mm-hmm. somehow I've amassed more than I went in with. So I'm a different self coming out of it. Um, I think the other thing I've had to be really comfortable with in these spaces of uh, difference is not always having to understand um, a language, a moment that I'm in but somehow I find a space of, I find a space of being in a kind of, it's not, it's not dis-ease, but it's, it's, it's a sense of not knowing in the ways I'm used to knowing. So I might gain my knowledge through other senses, whether or not it smells, that becomes something I can understand or gestures. So yeah, I, I, I come out a different self and that mm-hmm. self is always being remade with each set of encounters. Mm-hmm. I th- I, thank you, thank you um, for your words, your offerings. And I, I think maybe I'm um, just thinking about the moments where I've I've, I've, I'm, I've become surprised at myself, <laughs> let's see, like, um, uh, and paying attention to that. So like, uh, um, and just thinking about like, not trying to mediate through whiteness, right? Uh, and half of, half of who I am is, is French Canadian. So it's a bit of a, a kind of a challenge at times, right? But. Like I, I remember I was thinking about today too, and I was thinking about like, there was a moment I, I had spent um, in my personal life um, 11 years in a partnership um, with a, a mixed race uh, Chinese woman. And we lived with her folks uh, for a while, you know, uh, which is, you know, wonderful. And there was one part where I, I was like, how do I do this? How do I come to this place? And how do I give to the commun- this family, right? And then I returned, what happened was I returned to this text about Taltan people written in 1910. And it, the anthropologist and English language and you know, all the, there's sort of failings in this text and this idea, right? But, but the, hopefully the intention is good. So they, the, the anthropologist wrote about how the son-in-law moves into the house and how he is supposed to behave and how he is supposed to, how he is supposed to contribute to the family, right? And I practiced that. Um, And um, that felt like a good thing. And I was surprised at myself. I was surprised uh, um, that I could be that person. You know, and I felt like more myself than uh, than not. You know, because it was you get so familiar with not actually being yourself. <laughs> um. Thank you. I'm wondering if I should. Um, I do have more questions, but I would like to open it up to first the panelists. If you have questions for each other. 
um, anything that you want to ask each other? I, I do have a question for Andrea. I just am thinking about deep collaborations through cooking and wondering about taste. Like, and how does, like, when you're working with somebody so deeply making food and stuff, like, and when you share that food afterwards, does, does the taste live inside of your body differently? That's a really interesting question, but I'll, I'll start answering it, which I don't really think I can, by telling you how I learned to cook. Um, and I think it's left uh, a really profound understanding about how one comes to knowing oneself and those before, and perhaps those to come. So my grandmother taught me how to cook and how she taught me how to cook was by having me taste what she made. And then I had to try to figure out what spices and herbs were in it. And so it was, I was never told that this went into it, but I had to learn through, I guess, developing my own palate to what she taught me. And so we also never measured any items, any of the ingredients, right? So it was about a, a kind of kinetic embodied learning. And I think that really, I think over time, I realized that was a really deep, deep collaboration, a deep, deep sense of passing on knowledge to me that perhaps language as we know it, can't contain it. So it's about the sensations in one's body. And I imagine that those sensations change as well. Um, now you've asked me the question, I have to think about it, but I imagine those sensations change with experience, with, with the now, the place, the who, all of that. So I'll say, I'll just say yes. That, that, that it does change, but I actually haven't really thought about it until now. And this idea of cooking and cooking in the way I learned, and it was really interesting that the cooking I did with Pearl Brown was a similar type of cooking with no discussion about it. We sat and she, we made things together. We didn't say half a cup of flour here. It was about feeling the thing. It was about getting to know the ingredients in a very sensorial way. And so, you know, I, I see that as well as part of, it's taught me something about what collaboration is or partnership. Much of it, it is sensorial and not language-based either. I hope I answered you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for the question. <laughs> I wanted to say, Andrea, that uh, my grandma, like I learned to cook through my grandma and my mother, um, but my grandma was a person of very few words and she would actually hit my hand <laughs> like if I was washing the rice in the wrong direction, she'd just hit it and then turn it in the other direction. And then she'd keep my hand moving until she said that the rice was clean. And then, well, like through gesture, not through words. Um, I, I actually have a question for uh, Abadar. Um, around grandmothers because of the work that you're doing with different proximities or different um, relations within your family and the dresses. So I wanted to know if you could, I wish if you can speak a little bit to that. Yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> there's not much to show for it, uh, but I've, I've inherited some garments from my grandmothers on uh, the two sides of the family. And I have, um, culturally, I have more of a connection to my, my mom's side, which is the, the Persian side. Um, I speak the language, I, that's the culture I was immersed in growing up. And this garment um, is actually something, like it was a garment that my grandmother had made, I think for my uncle's wedding before I was born. And then when I was really young and we lived with them, 
uh, she didn't want it anymore. So she gave it to me and then I cut it up and I made this very like poorly made shirt. And I still have the shirt and I still wear the shirt. On the other hand, I inherited this garment from my dad's mom, which is this like long kind of coat. It's black and it's got gold flowers on it. It's very uh, formal. <laughs> um, and it's part of like Kurdish clothing uh, that you would wear to, to, let's say, like a fancy wedding or other occasions when you would dress up traditionally. Um, because I don't have a, don't really have much of a connection to my Kurdish, uh, or an understanding of Kurdish culture, my, uh, my only connection is through my dad and my grandparents. I have this garment and I don't feel like I, I should be wearing it. Uh, so I've been thinking through my art practice, uh, the pattern, and I keep reproducing the pattern in different ways, uh, but also keeping myself at a distance from this garment. Um, and it's, it's strange because as you know, Andrea was talking about, and, and Oyumi, you two were talking about kind of remembering the ways your grandmother's bodies uh, or the sensorial like embodied sort of experience of learning. I, I have, you know, I don't really know um, how my body should move if I wear this garment. I don't have a model for it. Whereas on the other side, it feels like there's less, uh, less baggage, maybe. <laughs> uh, it feels less intimidating. Thank you. Um, I would like to open it up to questions from the participants in, the, in, in this meeting gathering space. Any questions for the panelists or comments or stories, <laughs> if you wish to share? your own grandmother stories or reaching across communities. I have a story to share. <laughs> Listening to Abadar talk about clothing and thinking about that, the um, ancestral collaborations. I once experienced, I was visiting a friend in Montreal. She was um, uh, Transylvanian and she put a traditional skirt on me. And it was this thick, thick cotton, really heavy. And she had these blankets in this skirt that were, I didn't fully understand, but somewhat smuggled. Um, they weren't supposed to leave Transylvania. And when I put it on, I felt so powerfully this shared deep connection of place and um, yeah. and uh, and ancestors somehow and and in Transylvania there is there is uh, she and I had had some some physical shared features too but what it was this skirt that I put on I had a very very powerful experience. That's all I have to say, but I would be curious to know how for Abadar, or, you know, these co these considerations of ancestral collaboration, how you would reflect on that. Thank you. Ashok, you have your, thank you, I mean, Ashok, you have your hand up? <clears throat> yes. Uh, hello, everyone. My name's uh, Ashok. Um, I am, uh, I'm really happy to be here um, to see this panel of, uh, it's like a, pa a panel of family, right? People I know so well, and, and uh, uh, except it doesn't have that uh, anxiety of family of saying, I have to get out of the room. So, and I, I appreciate the, the, uh, the, the contemplative um, approach that's, that people are taking here. It's, uh, it, it does lead to a very emotional space. And I, uh, I, and you know, Abadar, when you were telling your story about being on the bus, it was, it was actually quite moving to hear that uh, and think of the non-linguistic, you know, approach, the connect, connectivity up around bodies, right? Uh, and it's something I think I need on the TTC. I still can't reach that horizontal bar, by the way. I'm just, <laughs> I can never get there. Um, thinking though about um, uh, the diaspora uh, and thinking back on, first on the root of that term, I mean, the idea of it being not just around people, but you know, sowing seeds. You know, and what happens with 
sowing seeds is you get this, uh, you know, this growth that happens afterwards through this dispersal. And I, I find that very interesting. But the, the question I have uh, for the three of you really is, th th there seems to be, and I'm, I'm becoming increasingly, uh, I wouldn't say troubled, but um, um, tr trying to trouble the concept of the, uh, the binarism that happens between indigenous people and other racialized folks. And it, it's often around place. And there's this uh, situational act, I suppose, that says, there's a the indigenous folks of, of uh, um, from time immemorial at a certain space and everyone else passing through or coming through, right? But uh, quite recently, I saw a very, very strong uh, young uh, indigenous graduate student talking about indigenous diaspora, which of course is reality because people are moving, uh, you know, in, in recent and long time history, sometimes because of colonial histories, but sometimes because of, of uh, various trade routes and things like that. So I'm, I'm very interested in, in how we link our, ourselves to the notion of diaspora um, across those divides, because it's very easy to talk of, you know, as, as uh, an immigrant, someone who comes from a racialized space of being part of a diaspora. But I'm also very curious to see how Indigenous folks are talking about their own di diasporas, and Peter addressed this to some degree through the familial uh, connection, but also how those diasporas can connect to others, right, in that same mix. So that's, I guess that's a very unformed question, but I'd, I'd love to hear people speak to that. So this is Andrea. Um, so you and I have started some of these conversations around um, the binarism around Indigenous folks. So. Again, you know, I come at it through uh, thinking about diaspora in a very nuanced way as well to include the kind of intersectional diaspora uh, solidarities that need to be thought about when we think about diaspora. So yes, the kind of scattering, but also what those scatterings allow for in terms of conversations around, again, solidarity and politics because I think the notion of diaspora is not solely grounded on culture, but it's also grounded on the politics that, again, from the root of the, the word and the term and the practice of how these scatterings have come into being. So I'm really interested as well in the idea around um, global indigeneities and their connection, particularly in, in these moments of globality um, and in these moments where we are um, not only rubbing up against each other, but um, informing each other's ways of being in the world. So I come at it again from the space, like I say, of trying to understand what it might mean to think about global indigeneities how they um, speak across uh, different forms of political formations and solidarities that need to happen. I, I, um, I also, I think part of why I'm still feeling emotional is because I'm, I want more of these kinds of conversations so that we can start having exactly what you're saying, uh, Ashok and Andrea, the, the sort of reaching towards and reaching across. And I have such a you know, healthy distrust of the English words <laughs> because they don't um, help me to feel uh, my body or you know, how my body is trying to make these offerings. Uh, I have spent a lot of time looking towards and uh, working with folks of color around the world to look at strategies of artistic practice, for example. Um, and there was an incredible, um, oh, I mean, there's so many, there's so many thing, uh, offerings from artists like um, uh, Wan Young Ping's work uh, and the, um, uh, divination, the I Ching machine that he made in order to create the House of Oracles, and just something so uh, perfect, wonderfully grounded in a worldview that's connected to his body, to his ancestry, and making this work, artistic work, 
artistic offerings, which, um, uh, I, I, you know, at the time I was really interested in galleries as well, uh, you know, as an artist, but I'm like these works that uh, in the House of Oracles rearranged and reorganized the experience of the gallery space in ways that felt like, you know, if I was just working with my Taltan body and not paying attention to that wedge that is often in between all of us, uh, it felt uh, expansive and uh, liberating uh, in ways that I had never imagined before. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, yeah. Um, thank you for this question, Ashok. I, I don't know if I have a very eloquent answer, um, but I, yeah, I, I, I've always been interested in diaspora as, as that expansive space as well, and not really, I, I, I've been skeptical about instances where it gets used only in context of like a nationality or like very contained um sort of way um because i think we're now in a moment where a lot of people are diasporic um and it's a way of navigating the world um not about more borders uh and i think mm -hmm. um i don't i i don't want to just create terminology that sets up additional borders um And I think within my art practice and my curatorial practice, I've been really interested in cross diasporic dialogue, um, not as a way of flattening experience, because I think that it, the experience is unique for each individual. Um, but I think there's still a lot of um, embodied, like sensed and um, lived sort of vibrations. <laughs> Uh, that folks uh, share and being able to be closer to each other around those things can be really uh, healing and just, I don't know, nice, <laughs> really nice um, to, to be in communities uh, where, where that, there's that kind of understanding. Um, but I'm not sure, I, you know, I think I, I, I'm, I'm skeptical of having things be really boxed uh, with, even within the, the term like BIPOC, um, where it's like categorizes like which, whose experiences what. Um, but at the same time, I am also mindful of not uh, wanting, you know, I don't wanna assume that all indigenous artists are comfortable with using the term diaspora if they don't live on their traditional homelands. Um, I think that's, you know, I, I would, mm -hmm. I've curated um, Indigenous artists in shows around diaspora, and it, it's always been a conversation. Um, and I guess I should also say, just as, as to credit, um, because the first time I came across this concept was in um, the writing of Alicia Elliott, who's a Haudenosaunee poet and writer. Um, but yeah, I, I think it, it has to be kind of a case by case uh, Unfortunately, at the moment, we're not at a place where we can we can do away with the categories without flattening. I feel. I'm mindful of the time, but I do want to, um, um, Jimmy. You have a question or comment, and then yeah. we'll go into breakout uh, yeah. rooms after that. Um, I'll just be uh, very brief. It's Chin Mi Yoon here. Um, just in terms of Ashok, I, uh, Tara Hogue, uh, who's Métis, I'm sure you know her and of her. Certainly, Ioni and Peter have worked with her as, as well as many others. But uh, she gave a wonderful talk uh, about exactly the idea of movement uh, as uh, a Métis person uh, tracing that lineage. I'm not sure if she used the word diaspora, but you might contact her and ask her if she, you could have a, you know, if she could share that talk with you. It was really good. And I won't get into it too much detail because uh, I can't remember all the particulars. It was quite well researched and um, beautifully written. 
Um, but I just wanted to point that out uh, and share that with you. And thank you for your comments. I, I just find everybody so amazingly soulfully articulate and uh, thoughtful. It's just been just beautiful to hear you all speak. So thank you. Um, I think I'll turn it over to Shoko. Uh, yes, you have your hand up. Uh, yes. Or do I just say we go break into our, our breakup rooms? Is that correct? I think so. It's okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, somebody is going to break us up into rooms and then we will reconvene um, to go over what we've discussed and we can continue these conversations in the breakout rooms and we'll regroup um, at about 2, uh, 2.51. Welcome, welcome everybody. It's Shoko speaking. Um, we've just returned from the breakout rooms. I'm just giving a couple more seconds. Um, but uh, yeah, so and then we will like to now um, hear your dokana uh, questions from your um, facilit from your facilitators of each group. Hello, everyone. I had the joy of working with Ayumi and Alice, and we we came up with a, 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 monstros, a monstrosity of a question. Um, what are the different ways of presencing, witnessing ourselves as an unexpected other, and holding a third space so that we can reach toward each other for deep collaborations despite and to undo government institutional wedges and colonial structures that persist. And I'll, I'll put that in the chat so you can digest it. Okay. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. Um, so my group was Andrea and Jim May, who are our old friends. So it was actually just amazing to listen to them speak. And um, but we, I have, I do have a couple of questions. We we were late to kind of getting to the questions part, but um, the two questions I will are one is actually can we ever become more than a visitor? And then beyond neoliberal capitalism, how can we create joy and ethic and ethics of care for all beings, human and non-human? Thanks, those are so great. Um, my group was Avatar, Peter, and Ashok, a uh, badass group <laughs> who, who mostly just listened to me talk. Um, <laughs> so thank you. Uh, our question um, kind of came out of uh, our conversation around food, but more generally about sharing. And so we asked, uh, how do we cook for people or use food as a practice of bringing people and communities together without falling into what uh, Avatar described as the mediating force of whiteness. Um, so in other words, how do we refuse kind of capitalist models of cultural exchange? And Abadar talked about like kind of the, <laughs> the server model of, of us serving and of serving <laughs> people um, or those kinds of um, think really easy trappings for us in these, in these contexts of cultural exchange. So thank you. Hello everyone. Um, I had the privilege of being in the group with Haruko, uh, Janice, Kelty, Shoko, and uh, Annie. And um, we also ran out of time because there were just so many wonderful questions. So um, it was very hard to narrow down, but I have a double question for us. Uh, do you ever actually feel like you do belong to a group? And what inspired you to feel connected or identify yourself as something? Am I, I guess I'm spotlighted. Uh, is, that, are, is that all of the, the groups? Yes? Okay, so I just wanna quickly um, thank everybody, everyone, all of the participants, all of the organization with Powell Street Festival, uh, the, the, the work behind the scenes uh, and in, in, in person uh, with uh, Destin, Gawa, uh, Emmy, and Sammy, um, Andrea, Peter, 
uh, Abadar, thank you so much for your stories and your presence. I, we we're talking in our small group about um, how, you know, there is a visceral feeling or there's like a sensation that's beyond words um, that took place today. And I, I think it's a deep spirit presence. So I want to thank everybody for your spirit uh, presence and your heart presence. Um, the next dialogue is going to be on November the 20th and it's called Monumental Reckoning. I hope um, that you will attend that. And I just want to thank you all again for such a wonderful gathering of ideas and, and um, with care, a lot of care. Very beautiful gathering today. Thank you so much. <laughs>